Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. My name is Beatrice Dupuy. I'm one of the co-directors of CIRCLE. And before we get started with this webinar, I have a few announcements uh, to make. So CIRCLE, to, just to give you some information about the, the center, uh, CIRCLE is housed in the College of Humanities at the University of Arizona and is one of 16 language resource centers um, funded by the US Department of, uh, of Education. And here on this particular uh, slide, you see our uh, web address as well as the uh, web link for all the um, language resource centers in the United States. And you, by visiting this link, uh, you have access to the resources that these various centers are producing. So among this, this particular uh, webinar this morning is actually part of a series that we've entitled Literacy Based Lesson Planning. And we will have, to, we have actually uh, scheduled two upcoming uh, webinars, one on November 18, uh, which uh, the presenter will be uh, Jose Aldemar Alvarez, and it'll be presenting on multimodal pedagogies in the L2 classroom, moving from language to a communication uh, paradigm. And on uh, December 5th, our last webinar in this series will be led by uh, Heather Willis Allen. Uh, and she will be talking about revisioning writing instru instruction using a design approach. So um, we are having this, uh, the first webinar of this series entitled Crafting Compelling Experiences, The Power of Stories, Scaffolding and, Sh and Sharing. And our presenter is Dr. Sherice Montgomery. Um, Sherice is an associate professor of Spanish at Brigham Young University. She has a PhD in curriculum, teaching, and ed educational policy with an emphasis in learning, technology, and culture from Michigan State University. She, is, uh, she has led numerous uh, workshops and in institutes for ACTFL, NFLRC, uh, our sister LRC at Hawaii, and others. She has served as co-chair of the Actful Pimsleur Research Award Committee, as an advisory board member for several different language resource centers, as a member of the New Visions in Foreign Language Education Task Force, and she's as an associate editor for the Journal of Critical Inquiry into Curriculum and Instruction. Cheris where, um, currently coordinates the Spanish teaching major program at Brigham Young University, where she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in assessment, language teaching methodologies, literacy development, and technology. So without further ado, I want to leave the floor to our presenter uh, and let her um, share with us uh, her, inf her knowledge and experience. So um, welcome. I'm excited to be here with you today. And um, it is very amazing to see people from so many different places in the world. Um, today's agenda is what you see on the screen here. Um, we're going to be talking briefly about elements of compelling experiences, how to find culturally authentic texts, how to scaffold those texts and what to do with those texts. As we work through the materials today, um, there are two things that you need to be aware of. One is that um, you'll, you, you have copies of the handout and the um, slides on the website. And so um, you'll definitely want to double check that. And um, the other is that if you didn't get the link, here is the link where you can go to download those materials. So just a quick bit of pedagogical information for you. So I, um, many of the materials that I'm I will be sharing with you today grew out of my work as a high school classroom teacher. Um, I taught for more than a decade and um, I have worked in a variety of different contexts most of them in an urban public high school with um, students who had lots of special needs and many students who had um, disabilities or um, low socioeconomic status, things of that nature. Um, because you all can't see everything that I can see, I thought it might be helpful for you to kind of get a quick sense of 
some of the languages and levels. Um, all the different languages, well, not all, but many languages are represented in this group here today. Um, and you all span elementary all the way up through university. So I will do my best to meet your needs today. Um, and feel free to contact me after the presentation if you have additional questions. So we're going to be considering three questions today. The first one is what do real life language learning and movie making have in common? How do filmmakers skillfully guide audiences through their content? And how can our experiences at the movies help us craft more compelling language experiences for our students? So we're going to get started by thinking about what movies have in common with real life. Um, and if you're like any of my friends, you may have already had extended conversations about this topic. Um, as you think about the answer to that question, um, I want you to think about what stories you've been telling yourself this year. And I suspect if you're like me, um, you might sometimes realize that the stories that you tell yourself change how you think, how you feel, and ultimately who you can become. What are some of the stories that have most influenced who you are and how you see the world today? I'd like for you to think about that question as we watch the first part of this video. That's right. Oops. What I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in Eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples, <coughs> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> now this, despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of tea. Okay, so, as you think about um, her experiences, we're going to fast forward to um, kind of a little bit later in the talk. I want you to hear one more clip. And as you listen to this clip, I want you to think about personal experiences that you might have had um, that are similar to what she describes here. Lives. All of these stories make me who I am. But to insist on only these negative stories is to flatten my experience and to overlook the many other stories that formed me. The single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Of course, Africa is a continent full of catastrophes. The immense ones, such as the horrific rapes in Congo. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Congo and... Um, and I want to, I want you to really think carefully about this particular quote. As you think about the stories that you've been telling yourself, especially about your own teaching this year and your own learning this year. Um, as someone who is in the middle of a pandemic and doing the best that you can, I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on the fact that um, our teaching isn't what we wish it were, or that we're not able to do all the things that we typically can, um, or a whole host of other negative things that we tell ourselves. And I'm going to encourage you to think about this quote in relation to yourself. 
that all of those pieces of our lives right now do make up who we are, but to insist only on the negative side of, or the negative pieces of our stories flattens our own experience as teachers and as educators, um, not because they're untrue, but because they're incomplete. You all are doing amazing things in addition to the things that aren't going so well. Um, and I had to tell myself this as I was preparing today. I had intended for this to be much more, um, I thought this was going to be much more interactive than um, I had time to put together. And that's probably a crazy thing to admit, you know, on a, on, to a worldwide audience. But I think it's important for us to be honest about the fact that we're all doing the best that we can. So as we move forward today, um, I hope that you'll think about the things that I'm sharing in two ways. The first way is what's here that is helpful to me. And the second way is what are some things here that maybe I'm just not ready for, or I just don't have time for right now. And I'm going to pick those things up and set them aside. And I just want to encourage you that um, that is okay too. And if you get to the end of this webinar, and you feel like there's only one thing that you could possibly squeeze into your life right now, that's okay. Um, so typically, if I were doing this in a face-to-face -face environment or even on Zoom where I could see all of your faces, um, which I cannot, uh, we would do some interactive activities. So we're going to do this at home. You're going to do this at home with whoever happens to be around. Um, and I will be your partner. And the way this works is you're going to make a rock. And then the second time you, you hit it, just like rock, paper, scissors. And then the third time, you're going to make a one, a two, or a three. And once you have done that, I'm going to do the same thing at the same time. And then you're going to subtract your score from mine to see what you rolled. So let's just try it together. One, two, three. So I rolled a two. So whatever you rolled minus two tells you which one of these things to look at. So if you rolled a three and I rolled a two, three minus two is one. And so your job, if, this were, if we were doing this in a classroom would be to tell me one word um, that comes to mind when you hear the phrase flattened experience. If we were to do it again, and I rolled a one, and let's say you rolled whatever you rolled um, when you subtracted it, you ended up with um, two, then um, you would be giving me a one sentence example of this phrase. And if you rolled a three, then you would be giving me an experience about a time when a single story became the only story. Um, that might be a little bit confusing since you all can't see uh, another person doing this. But the idea here is that once students read a text, there are lots of things we can have them do to focus on a tiny little piece. And so even though in the previous slides, I gave you a big chunk of text, now I'm asking you to focus on one tiny little piece and to start sharing with a partner things about that one tiny little piece. And you can do this sort of thing um, even if you're teaching virtually. It works much better, like I said, when you can see cameras or, or when I could put you in breakout rooms. Um, so all of that to say that we all teach who we are, um, our whole selves, our best selves and our worst selves. And if this is how you're feeling, um, it's okay to recharge. Your phone doesn't feel guilty for recharging and you shouldn't either. Um, so again, as we think about this, just think about how might you adapt what you are already doing. And with that, we're going to kind of dig into the content for today. So think of the last time you went to the movies. Think about what you experienced. 
And then if you haven't already found your Zoom chat window, open your chat window and type one word in the chat um, that describes your experience. And I'm gonna give you just 15 seconds. One word that describes your experience. Ooh, emotional, joyful, immersive, relaxed. It was so long ago, I know. Netflix counts. Okay. So learning a language is like going to the movies because, go ahead and give me one sentence. Learning a language is like going to the movies because, It's exciting. You don't know what to expect. It opens our view. It's like an adventure. You have to look at all the details. We're surrounded by multimodal input. It's amazing when you get to go with your family. It's so much fun. It's like a storytelling. Somebody else is at the helm. Going to the movies is both an interpretive experience and an immersive experience. And those two words are very important when we're thinking about working with language learners and language teaching. It definitely takes us to new worlds. So what could we learn just from the little bit that you've already put in chat about making our experiences for our students more interesting? You all had lots of things to say just with those two questions. And you'll notice that I gave you a novice level thing to do first, where you're just putting in a word. And then I gave you a sentence level thing. Um, so now we're ready to think about what movies have influenced you most. So I want you to think about a movie. For the pair part of this, you're going to post the title of one movie that has influenced you in the chat. And please set your chat settings to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see you or all see what you're saying. So the title of one movie that really made a big impact on you. And by the way, we will be saving the chat transcript for you. And so these movies might become really interesting texts that you could use in your classes. Um, or at least might give you something fun to, to watch while you are relaxing this weekend, which hopefully you all are going to do a little bit of. So now with somebody at home, that could be a pet or another person at your house, or maybe even a stuffed animal, if you're like me and don't have pets or people in your house at the moment, um, share why did that movie impact you so powerfully? And this is one thing that I want you to think about as you think about interacting with your students. Um, a lot of times our interpersonal interaction over Zoom can be really impersonal. And so it's okay to encourage your students to interact with the people in their immediate environment. Probably one of the things that you noticed is that there, and some of you have named these things in the chat, is that um, some movies impacted you because they're just so beautiful. Some because of the authenticity of the film. You're like, I have experienced that before and that resonates with you or it feels very personally relevant. A lot of times it's because the movie's complex and so it gives you lots to think about or it makes you feel something. So movies impact us cognitively in our heads, emotionally in our hearts, and ideally also spiritually and socially in encouraging us to take further action. It, they transform us in some way. And that's what we want our students to experience in our classes. We want the things that they come to do with us to transform them. But there's one problem with that in a language class and that is authenticity is usually very compelling, but it's also very complex. And so sometimes that produces what we call cognitive overload. Cognitive overload is basically a situation where your brain is getting too much information all at once and it can't process it all at the same time. And so one of our jobs as teachers isn't so much to deliver all the content, it's to manage the overload. Filmmakers are really good at doing that. 
they only have two to three hours to cover everything. If you think about it, you've probably even seen some really good movies that didn't last more than an hour. And a filmmaker, just like a teacher, has to address all the things that we have to address as teachers. They have to capture our attention as an audience. They have to explain the world that we are suddenly um, supposed to be immersed in. They have to provide clarification about things that we encounter in that world that we might not be familiar with. They have to keep us motivated to stay watching and they have to help us feel satisfied when we leave. That's a lot to do, but they manage to do it very well. So how do they do it? Well, first of all, movies are very content focused. Um, and because they are content focused, they expand our experience and our expertise every time we watch a really good movie. And not all movies are good, let's be honest. Um, so one thing that is kind of important for us to consider is um, that we want students to have opportunities then to interact with content, not just language. And we can do that with cultural texts and contexts, but also with academic content. Now, somebody asked, in, uh, what do we do if students say, oh, I haven't seen a movie or they're too expensive or whatever. And that's okay. Um, you can ask them about the movie of their minds and how they imagine things in their minds, what, what they think about when they, um, when they can daydream or whatever. Movies are also multi-sensory and multimodal. They evoke a lot of emotion. And in our classrooms, we want the texts that we use to also be multi-sensory and multimodal, meaning that they require not just our eyes, but that we're also using texts that have music. We're giving learners opportunities to interact in ways that help them move. Um, and that we're using things that you use multiple modalities, eyes, ears, et cetera, uh, senses to experience the text. Movies do a great job of showing things from multiple perspectives. Seldom do we just see one perspective in a movie. And that supports cognitive processing. The more different perspectives we have, the more our brain has to start integrating and thinking about. And so we wanna make sure that the tasks that we're giving our learners in our classes to do with these texts are things that actually require critical thinking and that the content that we're giving them is challenging. If it's not challenging, um, then they have, a, or, or the tasks are not critically engaging, um, then they have a tendency to be bored and tune out. And then movies also do a great job of developing understanding. And we tend to do this as moviegoers after we finish the movie, or even sometimes during, we're whispering, whispering to the people sitting next to us. Um, and afterward, as we all come out, everybody's usually talking, right? And it's because talking um, helps us to integrate the content and our thinking, and all of that consolidates our learning. Movies also show more than they tell. They, they usually let the costumes or the characters or the scenery or the dialogue produce the understanding rather than somebody standing there and telling you all the information. And this is one reason that our students sometimes find that um, fictional movies are more interesting than documentaries because the fictional movies allow us to experience things and the documentaries want to tell us, just like teachers. Not all documentaries, but some. So when we think about movies, movies give us an opportunity to move through the different kinds of activities that have a tendency to produce intercultural competence. Specifically, Movies give us a chance to observe and reflect on the worlds that we see. Movies give us a chance to interact with different types of text, um, whether those are images or sounds, you know, music, the musical score, the dialogue in the, in the movie. Movies give us a chance to compare and contrast and to think critically about what we're um, experiencing. 
when we finish a movie and sometimes during the movie, we have a chance to start making interpretations of what we're experiencing. And we usually do that through talking. And then movies give us a chance to confirm our inter interpretations. Um, and sometimes we do that with social media, right? With technological tools. Um, by talking to other people about what they thought about the movie after they've seen it, especially when a new one comes out. So we're going to watch um, just a short little movie here. And as you watch this, I want you to think about those five T's. What could a language teacher do with this film in their classes um, in order to help their students become better learners of culture? So take a look. things that you'll notice about that is it's cognitively challenging, right? It gives you multiple, the multiple perspectives makes you start thinking about what's going on. It makes you ask questions in your mind about what you are seeing. It's emotionally engaging. Uh, as somebody just posted in the chat, sharing is so rewarding. Yeah, it makes you feel something. It makes you think. It's socially satisfying, you end feeling good about that. Um, and it's personally empowering, right? It positions you to want to do things for other people, to want to change the world in some way, even if it's just in your own tiny um, part of the world. So we're going to pause at the end of each little section here. And if you'll direct your attention to your handout now, I need to preface this and you're asking great questions in the, in the chat and I'm going to let you continue to interact in that way without necessarily address, addressing all of the things that you're putting in there. Um, but what I want you to notice here is that I have given you some handouts and the handouts are designed to help you walk yourselves step-by-step step through planning a lesson based on a variety of culturally authentic texts by yourself once the webinar is over. We don't have time in 90 minutes for me to walk you through what could be a whole course in curriculum design, um, but this should be enough to kind of get you going, okay? So in the first handout, you'll see that you're going to pick a lesson or project or unit topic that you're gonna teach. And then you're going to think about what content could you use in that lesson? What career pathways or world readiness standards might you address? So these would be your, your standards here. 
And then you're going to think about what proficiency level are you trying to move your learners toward? Then you're ready to start thinking about the can do's, right? So what is one thing you want students to be able to do by the time they finish working with that particular topic? One piece of content, one kind of content uh, can do and one cultural can do. Um, so maybe the language can do for the, the most recent video that we just watched would be something like I can compare and contrast life in two countries or in two places. Maybe the content goal would be I can um, explain three reason, three ways that water challenges are currently impacting our society. And the cultural goal might be something about, I can explain how access to clean water influences what's possible in a culture or something along those lines. Or I can observe cultural norms, you know, related to water or something like that. You'll notice that I've said guest appearances here because mostly our grammar, our, our targeted language patterns and grammatical forms arise out of all of that content. I'm selecting my content so that they reinforce the forms I want to use, but I'm not making the grammatical forms the center of my lesson is what I want you to notice here. And then at the bottom, I have my vocabulary words. Now, obviously, there are a million vocabulary words that I could teach in that video or with that video. But when I say seven vocabulary words, I'm not saying you're just gonna limit the vocabulary to seven, but I'm saying, what are the seven words you're going to spotlight? What are the seven words that you want students to walk away really able to use by the end of their interaction with that text? And with that, we're ready to start thinking about texts. So we know from research that the number of minutes a child or a student spends reading and being exposed to texts changes the number of words per year that they're exposed to and that that changes their academic achievement which suggests for us that we need to have our students reading in our classes or listening or viewing texts but when I usually do workshops and ask language teachers, well, what makes reading in the target language difficult? They usually tell me grammar and vocabulary. And sometimes they'll tell me, well, because I teach a, a language that is not uh, like a character based language where the script is not romanized. Um, one of the things that I think is important for language teachers to understand is that there are lots of other reasons why reading can be difficult for our students. And a lot of those reasons have very little to do with grammar and vocabulary. Um, if they don't have a clear purpose for what they're reading, it's difficult for them to access or to know what reading strategies to use. A huge one is lack of prior knowledge. If they don't already have some knowledge about the topic, it makes it really hard, even for a native speaker with excellent proficiency to understand the text. We have to activate their prior knowledge or build it if they don't have it. A lack of reading strategies. So a lot of our students um, don't necessarily have great strategies for reading. Things that good readers do instinctively, a lot of our students don't. And so we have to explicitly teach those. Sometimes the text is difficult because of the cultural references and our students don't have the cultural background they need to understand the text. Um, a lot of religious texts you run into this with, for example. Sometimes it's because we just haven't done a good job of uh, formatting or organizing the text for our students. Sometimes it's the transitional words and phrases that they don't know or that the text is written in academic language or that they don't have a good base of oral language. So even if they can figure out what the word says, they don't know what it means. Um, genre awareness is another huge one. And then of course, there are the normal issues of if you have a student who just doesn't have good decoding skills or character recognition skills or a student who has special needs. 
Um, so all of those things can make reading hard. We also know from research that there are a lot of things that make reading easier. Um, and I am going to respond to a lot of these questions as we go. Um, so one thing that makes reading easier is if we give our students access to high interest materials. Um, and one way to, one of the things that research suggests is that the more interest a student has in what they're reading and the more background knowledge they have about what they're reading, the more likely it is that they will be able to read far beyond their actual proficiency level. One way to identify which texts are going to be most helpful to our students is to think about social media. So when you're choosing a text for, a, for the classroom, think about what would make you click if, this, if the title of this text were to scroll across your social media feed, or if you were to see an image from, this, from the text you want to use in class, would it make you click? Um, and specifically, we click on things on social media that are cognitively challenging, things that help us to do something we wanna know how to do or to solve a problem, for example, emotionally engaging. So think about all those funny cat videos and silly videos and memes that you click on. S things that are socially satisfying. We click on pictures of our friends. We click on people, you know, on, on articles about celebrities because it's socially satisfying, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, or things that are personally empowering, things that help us to be better people, um, self-help kinds of texts. So Somebody meant, uh, asked where you can find these kinds of texts. And I've given you a little link to my website here at the bottom. And um, you can click on, um, actually, let me see here. Um, if you go to my website and click on culturally authentic materials, it will pull up a list of languages. And I apologize, I did not have all of the, li the list of all of your languages early enough to generate pages for all of them, but there are pages for a fair number of them that have a whole list of culturally authentic sources for different kinds of texts like advertisements and infographics and videos and children's books. And I have a lot of things that I still haven't had time to add that I will continue to add for you. Meanwhile, if you have links to really great sites, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll make sure that they get added to that website as well. Uh, if you've got good texts for your target language. Okay, so your next step if you were to be planning a lesson then is once you've kind of figured out your language content and cultural goals, you're ready to start finding texts. And what I tell my student teachers is that it's really important for them to locate at least three texts about the same topic. So if I were doing this um, lesson or activity about water, I would want two other texts about water. If, I'm, if the focus of my lesson happens to be the target culture, then I'm gonna want two other texts about the target culture. And a text can serve multiple purposes. Um, searching in your target language and using a country specific search engine and putting your search terms in quotation marks if you're searching in English um, can dramatically increase the likelihood that you will find the text that you want. Here is kind of a list of the different types of texts that you might want your learners to consume. So just like when we go to the movies and we go get our snacks, um, we need to figure out, you know, are, is our, are, are the texts that we want learners to work with just going to provide a little snack? Are they going to have a whole meal? What are we looking for here? I usually recommend to my student teachers that they choose one informational text, one sort of literary text, like a poem or a story. Uh, informational text would be like a newspaper article or um, a how-to text or instructions, um, things along those lines, a scientific text maybe. And then one multimedia text, like a song or a video, um, something along those lines. And here's a menu of possible texts that your learners could use 
to get the information that you want them to know or that they, they need to know about the topic that you're working on. And you're gonna to want to evaluate the quality of the texts by um, making sure that first of all, your texts are easy to see and hear. So there are tons of wonderful things on YouTube that are not very useful for the classroom, not because the content isn't great, but because the sound or audio quality is so poor um, that it's, it's not helpful. So first making sure that what you're choosing is something that they can see and hear. And then secondly, making sure that what you're choosing is representing a variety of cultural perspectives, uh, genres, modalities, and viewpoints. So making sure that your text is, tech, the texts that you are choosing manage multiple things. Not every lesson is going to do all of these things, but your lesson should do several of these things. And the better you get at this, uh, you know, at finding texts, the better you will get at, at managing that. Accessibility. So thinking about filmmakers again, how do filmmakers make texts accessible to their audiences? How do they help us to understand? The first is that they provide bite-sized chunks of life's complexity. So what filmmakers don't do is separate everything into, into separate categories and say, okay, now we're gonna work a little bit on grammar. Now we'll do a little bit with content. Now we'll do a little bit with culture. They leave it all integrated, but just give us a little bitty bite, just like when you're feeding a baby. You don't give the baby necessarily completely separate ingredients. You just give them a small bite of the larger thing that you're eating. Movie makers progressively develop the plot. They don't try to tell us everything about the character in the first three minutes of the movie. But we tend to do that as language teachers with texts. We want students to read the whole text and we wanna talk about everything in the text all at once. Um, instead, think about how could we just do a little piece at a time? You'll notice that everything about the theater guides us through the experience. And we have to do the same thing for our students. We really want to guide their flow through the text, just like the direction of these, um, you know, the positioning of the, the physical environment here guides the audience um, and the flow of the audience through the theater. We want to guide their noticing, just like the numbers on these chairs guide us to our correct seat. We want to anticipate breakdowns. Where is the text going to be tricky for them? And we want to integrate supports in those places. And so I'm going to show you some examples a little bit later um, of what that looks like. And then finally, we want to facilitate communication around the text. Um, one way to do that is by making sure that our instructions are really clear. So one thing that I tell my student teachers is that you know that short-term memory can only hold about seven chunks of information. And as a result, we really need to keep our instructions much more simplistic than we tend to do as teachers. As teachers, we tend to say, okay, we're gonna do this thing. And then we give them a very long paragraph full of explanation about it. And we tell them all the details about what we want them to do. And by the time we get to the end, anybody who is still listening is probably still confused because we gave them so many words. And I find this to be true even for adults, even in your native language. So I find that if I will limit my instructions to no more than five steps and put only one step on each separate line, and not use more than seven to 10 words per step, it will be much easier for my students to absorb. And you're going to see that in all of the examples, um, or at least most of the examples today. So look for that. Look at how I've formulated the instructions and see if that helps you make things more, if it makes things more clear for you. And if that's true, see if you can emulate that for your students. Another thing that um, we can do as teachers is to use what we call in the research literature, text sets. Text sets are 
sets of texts that, or multiple texts on the same topic that address it from different points of view. So if you look at this bullet, uh, this billboard, um, it is a picture that I took while I was in France. And the billboard shows three different um, scenarios where this word applies. And if you take a minute to think about it, you realize that the word probably means something related to trust, right? That it takes trust for the guy who's having his neck shaved with a straight razor. It takes trust for the blind person to allow the seeing eye dog to lead them around. And it takes trust to be in a relationship. So when we use multiple texts together, these would be, this would be an example of three different images that are forming multiple texts. We position our learners to get a much more well-rounded sense of what the word is that we are trying to share with them. Um, Mimi Met calls this, uh, she, she does in her presentation sometimes, she, she used to talk about, it's not just a question of repeating the word. We tend to say, oh, confiance, confiance, confiance. And I'm probably butchering that French teachers, I'm sorry. Um, what we really need to be doing is repeating the word in different contexts so that students start to figure out what it means by what's included and by what's excluded and by the different relationships. Their brains will start to put that together. A really easy activity to do with this kind of a text is um, to say, I see, I think, I wonder. So I could ask learners to name everything that they see in pairs. I see a man, I see an ear, I see a dog, I see the ocean, I see a shirt, right? They're just naming things they see at the word level, which is a very novice level task. Then they can say, I think, and they're going to talk about what they think about what they see. And that requires more of a sentence. I think the man might get cut. I think the dog is cute. Uh, I think that they must be in love. And then you're going to talk about what you wonder. I wonder if the man goes to this barber every day. I wonder where the blind person is walking or if they usually walk in the city like that. And you get the idea. So you can have a whole series of slides related to, let's say, an, an advanced placement um, topic like beauty or um, whatever it is that you're studying, technology. And you can flash up the different texts and have your students take turns um, talking with a partner using the I see, I think, I wonder technique. And every time the slide changes, they would get a new partner, depending on you know, if you can do that right now in your classes. The last big piece that movies do a really good job with is that they think in terms of three phases of audience engagement. We have the pre-activities, right? Where you've got all of these people who are kind of coming in and sitting down and they do a really good job of setting expectations. What is expected of us and what is required of us as the audience. Um, the other thing that they do is um, in showing the previews, they kind of get us primed for being ready for the movie, right? The during activities, are things that allow us to intuitively respond. So if they put lots of sad music and a cute puppy and something happens to the puppy, you're gonna get an emotional response out of the audience. If they put somebody really interesting and then um, you know something wonderful happens to that person, the audience is naturally going to feel happy because they felt connected to the person. So one of the things that we have to think about as we are working with culturally authentic texts is think about all the ways you tend to respond in a movie. You cry, you laugh, you get confused. You might be problem solving or trying to figure out like who did the, you know, what, what's gonna happen next or who did the crime or whatever it is that you're watching. And we wanna think about how can we engage our learners with the texts in such a way that we generate the same kinds of responses. Sometimes those responses are going to come from what's already in the text. 
And sometimes those responses are not going to come from the text because the text isn't all that interesting, but what we ask learners to do with it becomes interesting enough to generate the responses. Okay, so that leads us to the post phase, right? So during the movie, we're engaged with the film and everything that's going on. And then after the movie, we talk with our friends and we express our opinions about the movie and we share what we've learned and we connect it to other experiences that we've had in our lives. So we wanna make sure that after students engage with a text, they've had opportunities to do those same things, that they get to say their opinions. And those don't have to be complicated. That can be something like, I like, I don't like. Me gusta, no me gusta, right? Um, I think, I don't think. Creo, no creo. It can be really, really simple. And even opinions like, he should or he shouldn't. Debes, no debes. You should or you shouldn't do this thing. Or I can say it in more complicated language. Instead of the present tense, I could use the subjunctive. Um, recomiendo que, I recommend that you X, Y, Z, right? So just because I'm having students express opinions does not necessarily mean I'm using advanced language functions to do that. And that is where, as a teacher, we have to be thoughtful about what we want students to be able to do in our can-dos. Okay, so now we're gonna pause for a quick second. And I'm going to give you uh, just a minute to look in your handout. You'll notice the page numbers are in the, the lower corners here so that you can follow what's going on on the slides. I'm gonna let you kind of look at this and think about a text that you have used recently in your class. And then think about whether you asked students to do any of these things. These are all tasks that require some kind of critical thinking. And while you do that, I'm just gonna briefly check the Q&A and see if there's anything um, critical that we need to address right now. Uh, so one of you asked, um, how do I succeed in choosing a movie that can satisfy the needs and preferences of my learners? who differ in their likes and dislikes. Um, and so that is something that, one thing that you have to do is kind of like if you were to go to the movies as a family, right? Not everybody necessarily wants to see the same movie. And so sometimes you're gonna like what's offered and sometimes you're not. And that's why we have to use lots of different types of um, texts. Uh, is there a reason for choosing the number seven specifically? Yes. Um, because our brains generally can only hold about seven chunks of information. And um, if you are one of the ones who sent me an email, I'll be happy to reply to that later. The links to the videos are all on my website, or if they're not, they will be um, after I rest a little bit today. Uh, by Monday, they will, I will have those up. Um, okay. So, uh, the next thing you're going to want to do once you have determined the thinking tasks is to figure out then what are the pre, during, post um, kinds of activities that I might have my students do. And sometimes we get so focused on pre, during, post that we forget what the purpose of those activities are. And so I like to reframe this as what conversations are learners going to have about the texts during the different phases of the lesson, before they read the text, during the reading of the text, and after the reading of the text. Um, when we're working on the pre part of the activities, we want learners to have a chance to make connections between their prior knowledge and experiences that might be relevant and what we're going to encounter in the text. We want to break the text into smaller chunks and we want to help them create what is called schema, which is like a mental map of what they're going to encounter and make predictions about that. During, and I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. During reading activities, um, we want to, so we can do pre-activity, like one pre-activity for all the texts that we're gonna use. So maybe I'm gonna use three or five texts but I'm only gonna make one pre-reading activity. You could have three or four if you want, but, but you only really need one. During reading activities, however, we need a separate activity for each of the texts. 
And those activities should be performing these three functions, specifically that we want whatever activity we're giving learners to do, to force them to do something with the content of the text. So the during reading activity isn't just read the text out loud. The during reading activity asks them to do something with the meaning or the content of what they are reading. And that might mean that we read a little bit and we stop and do something, and then we come back and we read a little bit more. So for example, maybe I'm going to read a little bit about, maybe I'm teaching in a dual language immersion classroom in elementary school, and we're reading about um, plants and how plants grow or migration and how birds migrate. And so we're going to read a little bit about that. And then they're going to go do a simulation where they pretend to migrate and then they come back and they do some more reading, right? But they're doing something with the content that they read about. Building metacognitive awareness, helping them to be aware of their own thinking and their own strategies for reading, and then checking for comprehension. Then we're going to design post activities for the experience. And the post activities are going to do just what they do in a movie theater, right? When we get done, we usually describe the movie to the people that went and saw some other movie in the theater because we didn't all want to go see the same thing, right? And so we summarize what happened in our movie, we synthesize the information from the movie, and we share what we learned. And we want our activities to do the same thing for our learners. Okay, so now we're going to take a little bit of a pause, and I'm just going to be quiet for about 15 seconds for you to kind of breathe and jot down anything you don't want to forget. And then I'm going to show you how I might go about taking a text and making it easier to read for students, not by changing the content of the text, but by changing the format of the text. So take a second to jot down anything that you think you need to remember before I keep talking. Okay. So one thing that's interesting about movies is that the people behind the camera do some really great things when they edit the film that makes the film more interesting. So if I were just to put the camera on you as you went about your daily life, I would get this long series of footage. And then if I were to say, okay, now I want all of your friends and neighbors to watch that footage all the way through. It probably wouldn't be all that interesting, at least most of it, um, if your life's like mine right now. Um, but what movie makers do is they guide our attention with action sequences. They change the camera angle so that we have to pay attention to something different. They zoom in and do a close up so that we notice something that's really important. Or they do a flashback so that we look back into the past of the particular character or situation that we are exploring. And they use lighting and color to attract our eye and make us pay attention to specific things. We can do the same thing as teachers in our language classrooms. So we can guide their attention with action, meaning we need to ask ourselves, what are learners gonna do with this text? And the more physical, the better, even when we're in a, a virtual setting, the more you can have learners suddenly stand up and say, okay, I want everybody to stand up and I want you to you know, clap every time you hear X, Y, Z in the text. Or every time um, you see something or we come across something, I want you to make a sound effect, right? The more physical you can make whatever it is that you're asking them to do, the more powerful it will be. We want to think about the perspectives. So from whose point of view do we want them to notice things? And, we, and I'll give you some examples of what that looks like in a second. And we're going to guide their attention with formatting. So here's our first example. Let's say that I was really lucky and I found this really great text that talks about nine keys for triumphing in a um, work interview. 
And so I want my learners to read this nice text and look how nicely it's formatted and each thing is numbered even and has different colors and oh, this is a great text. I'm so excited. And I might in my former life as a teacher have just thought, well, I'll photocopy it and there we go. But I want you to see what happened when I started to apply the principles that good filmmakers use to scaffold a text. Notice what I changed here. I used a spotlight, meaning I removed all the distractions that were around the text. Suddenly, it already looks easier to read. And it definitely will be easier to read for your uh, learning disabled students, students who are learning disabled. Then I might do a close up, right? So we went from this to just focusing on one small area of the text. We're just gonna zoom in on that chunk and I'm gonna have learners do something with that chunk. I can use lighting to change what they notice with the font. I really wanted to use a copyrighted thing. Um, and so I've just got the link up, whoops, the link up here on the slide and you can look later. But what I want you to notice is that it is an alphabet made out of brand names. And for those of you living in the United States, and even those of you living abroad, you'll probably be able to recognize most of the brands only from one letter. And the idea there is for you to realize formatting and font makes a huge difference in our ability to remember things. And we can capitalize on that as language teachers by changing the fonts that we use and making sure that we're not using fonts that are so boring that they're not memorable, but that they're not so stylized that they're difficult to read. Here's an example of what happens if I scaffold with color. So this is a poster I made a long time ago when I was a brand new teacher. And my goal was to show the go verbs uh, to my students. And I wanted them to pay attention to the ending. But what I didn't realize until after I got done was that in color coding it like this, I had suddenly revealed for myself what the big secret uh, was in making two form commands. Um, the two form commands, which I'd looked for a pattern in those ever since I was a student myself, are just whatever comes right before the go. So you can help students see patterns. Graphic design can help you. So here's an example of a set of worksheets that uh, my colleague Stephen Schutte and I put together with some of our participants uh, in a project-based language learning um, uh, workshop. And the goal of the, the activities was for students to be able to read, uh, I'm sorry, to, um, obtain information through research, obtain information and confirm information through interviews, and then be able to design a product based on what they had learned. So it's kind of what we want students to do anytime they do any kind of a project. And our goal was to take the process and break it down into a series of small choices with simple language that was visually illustrated so that even students who didn't have strong language skills could participate in the activity. Um, thanks to our wonderful participants, I now have most of those worksheets translated in a variety of languages. Um, and I don't have them all posted yet, but I will get them posted. Right now, they're only posted in English on my website for you. Here's an example of how a French teacher um, scaffolded vocabulary with these same design principles. Notice she's using big font to draw their attention to the, the word. She's using color to draw their attention to different aspects of what's going on. You can also scaffold with choices. So I can give learners, uh, this is from a dual language immersion classroom where they're learning about amphibians and mammals and you know the different types of animals. And so for each category, they had to talk about, you know, how they have, what their skin's like, how they have babies, 
um, how they breathe, et cetera. And so she's giving them two or three choices for each one and they have to go through and circle. Um, I can ask students to do things. So I can give them scaffold their task completion by giving the first part of the song in order. And then their job is to connect the first part of the song to the second part. And this arrow is actually in the wrong place. It should be up here in this first box. So they're connecting the first half of the sentence with the second half as they listen. <coughs> Excuse me, I can also scaffold noticing language patterns with design in non character in character based languages. So, for instance, um, this is my favorite one of my favorite books in Chinese. Um, primarily because it's the first book that made me realize I might actually be able to learn Chinese. I was preparing for a workshop. And I asked a Chinese friend to tell me what the words said to basically read the book to me. So she was kind of reading in translation. And once I realized that as she read, the things were getting repeated, I said, wait, 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 let me see if I can figure it out. Okay, tell me what these characters are again. And essentially the essence of the sentences are things like big seeds have big wig big wishes, sharp seeds have sharp, sharp wishes, long seeds have long, long wishes, round seeds have round, round wishes, etc. cetera. Um, and so what was helpful about this particular text is that because of the way they laid out the text where everything is lined up that matches, it's really easy for me to see what is the same and really easy for me to see what is different. And I have started applying that even in my Spanish classes. And it's much easier for students to see patterns when you line the text up like that. Okay, these next couple of worksheets are probably going to be pretty overwhelming to look at. I haven't had time to go back in and simplify them for you. But what they do do is they say, okay, so if I wanted to take a text and reformat it so that it was more accessible to my learners, what would I need to do? And this basically is a checklist that will walk you through every step of the process. Um, and you can go through and make choices anytime there are checkoff boxes. So when we want to support student learning, how do we know what to scaffold and when to do it? Um, all of these different areas are things that we could scaffold. We can scaffold how the learner's thinking. We can scaffold the content. We can scaffold the process. We can scaffold the purpose or the context for the activity. And we can scaffold our classroom culture as well as the text itself. Um, when we're focused specifically on texts, <clears throat> we are focusing on um, these five things. We want to activate their prior knowledge break the text into chunks, create a kind of a mental map for them, give them a chance to do something with the text and help them to understand the meaning of the text. So these next few slides are going to be lists of strategies that you can use to do these things. And they're not all posted on the website yet, but I will um, by the, the next week have links to all of these things for you. Um, and in many cases, they are templates that you can just download and use immediately with your classes. So we can activate prior knowledge with lots of different strategies. Um, you'll notice here would be an example of an affinity diagram where I'm having learners brainstorm on separate post-it notes. And then after they brainstorm, they get together and look at all the post-it notes and they read what they have written. And then their job is to start categorizing or classifying the post-it notes by grouping them together. I can use uh, strategies like grab a word. So I might put lots of different words with, with or without images um, in the center of a table and put students in small groups. And I'm going to give some kind of clue or description. And their job is to try to be the first person to grab the word and hold it up. Um, so this is a good pre-reading activity to kind of review vocabulary or to pre-teach vocabulary. 
I can use things like describe and draw. So you'll notice the instructions at the bottom. Find a partner. If you're person A, face the screen. B, face your partner. A, describe the image you see. B, draw what you hear. So that would be my, those would be my instructions for that activity. If we were face to face, I would actually do this with you um, so that you could get a sense of how it works. But this is a good way to practice, um, this, to practice vocabulary that they're going to need before they start reading the text. We've already done, I see, I think, I wonder, but you can also have students pull out their cell phones and do it with their cell phones um, with the photos that are on their phones. We don't take pictures of things we don't care about as a general rule. So you've already got emotional investment if you have students doing something like that. We can have students make predictions for pre-reading. So this is a story, a culturally authentic book about a little girl and I'll just tell you more or less what it says in English. Neither the children of Greentown nor the children of Blue Town wanted to be friends with Maria, who lived in the middle of the two towns. Maria felt each day felt more alone. One day, um, she started to cry so much that her own tears erased her and she became invisible. So the whole book is kind of about bullying, actually, but it's written in very clear, simple Spanish and very descriptive language in the first few parts of the text. So I could do things like give students the blurb and ask them to write uh, or to predict with their partner what they think will happen next. Um, as we're reading the text, I can read the first few pages aloud to the students and then ask them to draw what they are hearing. Um, and there are also lots of YouTube videos online where other people have made videos of part of the text. And so you could show part of the video as an introduction before students read the text so that they have more visual uh, schema in their heads. I can break the text into chunks. So one thing that we as language teachers sometimes have trouble with is we think that if we're going to use a text, we have to use the whole thing. And that's not true. I could just have students read newspaper headlines. Uh, so th these three texts all happen to be about clothing. The first one, the headline is something to the effect of um, adolescents who express their ethnic identity enjoy better mental health. This middle one is a magazine article that says clothing, is it a symbol of identity for nerds? And this last one is an abstract from a research article that's talking about consumption and identity and the process of self-creation, right? So I could use these three texts in a unit on clothing. I could use these three texts in a unit on identity um, or for a variety of other things. But the idea is that it's not so much the text that I have to worry about how long or short it is, it's that I have to make a decision about how much we're going to use. And if I'm going to make everybody read the whole thing, or are we gonna each read a little part and then talk about it? And that's what these activities do. Um, Jigsaw, most of you are probably familiar with. With story switches, I read one story, my partner reads another, and then we put the stories away and we have to tell each other what happened in our story. With table tents, I would give students two quote, a, a piece of paper that looks like this, for example, in half and it sits on the table. And on one side is a quote from the article or story and on the other side is another quote and students walk around in pairs and they have to read the quotes on either side and decide which one they wanna talk about. I can create conceptual schema. So one really great way to do that is with infographics. So this one happens to be about friendship and it talks about what friendship is based on. Um, it talks over here about the most, the top five and the least five sought after qualities in friends. It talks about the origins of friendship. And so with this one, um, I might have students stand, I might, say, okay, I'm going to tell you some strategy, some uh, characteristics or qualities, and your job is to stand if this applies to you. And I would actually do this even on Zoom. 
Um, so you all can try it if you're sick of sitting. I might say, if you think uh, loyalty is the most important quality in a friend, stand up and everybody would stand that does. And what that does is it gives you a visual representation so that then students have something to talk about or you can help to facilitate the conversation. But we're grounding it in a text that's culturally authentic. They don't know every word on this text and I'm extracting words that I want them to pay attention to. And we might do that little popcorn poll as a pre-reading activity and then I'm going to give them this text again and ask them to do something else with it. So we're going to make multiple passes through the text for different purposes. I can also create conceptual schema by giving learners opportunities to look at real world connections. So for those of you familiar with the, the book, The Little Prince, um, we happen to have a classroom set of these in Spanish and in French. And so the French teacher and the my Spanish classes would have uh, the Frenchies and the Spanish people read it at the same time. And then we would do activities together. And I went to her um, as a new reader of this text and said, what's a bow wow? Like I can't find it in the dictionary. And she laughed and she said, oh, there are these giant trees in Africa. Now this was pre-internet days uh, or well, the internet was just young. And um, so I went and found a bunch of pictures of baobabs. This happens to be me in front of a baobab at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And um, I decided that I was going to take each chunk of text and illustrate it either with a picture from the book or with a picture from the internet of each of the phases that it's talking about. So that as students read, they're like, oh, it's talking about a seed, that makes sense. Um, and then I'm asking students to do things with those texts. So for example, um, they're making personal connections to the text when they read things like, if he were to take a whole herd of elephants with him, the herd wouldn't be able to eat up one single baobab. Well, that didn't make sense to me until I did some research and discovered that the bark of baobab trees um, stores thousands of gallons of water. And so elephants will actually graze on the bark to get water. Um, and so then we talked about what are the baobabs, the things that start as little problems and grow into big ones in your lives. And they drew and illustrated their own um, examples. And then finally, we can develop interactive tasks. And so I'm going to quickly um, just kind of show you what some of these are that are in here. And then um, if you have additional questions, you can ask me later. So hearsay is a way that you can read a text where students are in partners and they have to actually listen to what the partner said. So if I say, if I start and I say one and I wouldn't be able to see my partner's paper, my partner heard one, so they followed across to find out what to say. So they say three. I heard three, so I say seven, and it goes back and forth. So in a text, it would look something like this. If I start, I would say, reading is an important skill. My par partner heard that, and they have to look to see what it was that I said. Oh, here's what she said. And they followed across to figure out what to say back. And so even though it's kind of like a dialogue, it forces them to really listen and to connect the sound and the symbol together. And that's an idea that um, I learned from Helena Curtin, who generously shares so many things with the profession. Um, and then we can engage learners with meaning of text. So there are lots of ways to do that. I can have students read, and every time they come to a bold statement, they have to respond by putting a, a symbol over here on the right in the box. Um, you can also do this with the annotation tools in Zoom um, if you make your worksheets a little with a little more space so that you can quickly see everybody's response at once. I can use texts that naturally bold the main ideas and have students go through and read the red keywords, read the bolded main idea, and then work together in partners to find two supporting details for each idea. Thank you, Kate. Um, I can say something 
So I can ask um, my students to go through and read until they come to a mouth and then they turn and say something to their partner. I can have them read and retell texts. Okay, I can have them sequence things. I can have them record the text, make an audio recording like a radio show. I can have them do reader's theater. You've already seen popcorn. Scavenger hunts, there's a link on the website to a class that is in the middle of a scavenger hunt that's pretty fun to watch. Um, graphing, this one you'll want to play with. It's a little spinner and if you take this link and click on it, um, you'll see that you can, students can spin it and then respond to the question there. So I know that was kind of a whirlwind tour of things that you can do uh, in terms of stories and scaffolding and how you can have them start to share their comprehension. This is a little self-assessment that you can use to think about when you've planned your lessons using the handouts, have you done these things, yes or no? Um, the remainder of the handout just provides additional checklists and strategies for you. The main thing that you need to notice is that when you're planning language, we don't just want to plan what we want to come out of their mouths. We also have to be planning language for the content and the thinking tasks in the group work. Uh, we can make sentence frames to help them with that language. We wanna think about building academic language. And then there is kind of a list of key principles at the end. So to wrap up here, Award-winning language teaching and learning starts with the stories that we tell ourselves. Stories are naturally engaging. We all love a good story. If all of this seems overwhelming to you, or if you finish listening to this and think, oh, I don't like the story that I'm currently living, you have the power to change that and say, this is not how my story is going to end. This is just where I'm at in the middle of the story right now. And the character's always in the middle of problems in any kind of a really good movie. So if your life feels a little overwhelming and you're kind of in the middle of a lot of problems, just know it means you're gonna have a great ending. Um, we're gonna skip that one. And thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I am happy to answer them. Uh, feel free to email me and please take the poll. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for such a compelling uh, webinar and for sharing a wealth of, you know, strategies uh, to work with text. Um, I just posted in the chat, if you have any questions for our presenter, please post them in the Q&A. We'll just take a, a couple minutes uh, to answer them. And Sherry has shared our, our information so you could always contact her if you have more in detail um, types of questions. Um, I see one that says, how can we enhance the better perspective in our students? And I'm not sure that's from uh, Rena, but I'm not sure that I totally understand the question. So if you're still yeah. here, Rena, feel free to. Yeah, and I guess the other question that's still um, in the Q&A is uh, how do you, when you select a movie and it doesn't really, uh, maybe meet the expectations of students or because it is a requirement, uh, they might start rolling their eyes. So how do you ensure that students will find, you know, to create interest in what uh, you are proposing? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're saying if your curriculum requires you to use texts that are not super interesting, how yeah. do we fix that? Is that the question? Well, the question is that if they feel obligated, if students feel obligated to watch the movie, it seems that sometimes they may not care because it is a requirement. Ah. So one thing that I am a real fan of um, is choice. Yeah. So I might say, and, and I actually do this a lot with my um, college students, I will, but I would do this in high school as well. I would say, here are three different video shorts, or here are three different texts about this topic. You need to choose two of them to read or to watch or to do something with. Um, and if you don't like these two, you can go find another one and propose it to me. Um, and what that does is it encourages them to suddenly go dig into the target language. 
they can also pitch the movie that they selected, right? Exactly. For, right? So, the language activity. Yeah. And then it becomes part of whatever is suggested for the class, right? Yes. So we're just, they're being very congratulatory in their That's comments. So, Thank you. Yeah. And I do agree. I mean, the, the strategies that you've shared for, you know, different stages um, um, of working with a particular text are, are really useful, I think. I see a question about limitations to the powerful tool of movies. Yes. So one thing I probably didn't emphasize enough is with something like a movie, um, I would normally just use a small clip like we did today in the webinar. Um, with the longer TED talk. Um, the other thing that I would say about movies is I usually show the first 30 seconds of the movie and tell students, I just, I'm going to only show you 30 seconds and I want you to just relax and kind of see how much you understand. See if you can tell me, you know, the gist of what's going on. Once that 30 seconds is over, then we stop and we talk about it. And then I start the, the movie or the, the video clip over again. And my reasoning for that is now they've got a sense of how fast it's going to go. They kind of have a better sense of what to expect. And so it's easier for them to pay attention the second time when I say, okay, so now let me give you some something to notice. So as you watch this time, I want you to notice this thing. And then the third time through the, the text, I say, okay, now that you know what it's about and you've noticed these things and we've talked about those, we're going to watch it again, but I'm going to give you a during viewing activity to do. So now when you watch, I want you to check off all the words that you hear that are on this list. Or I want you to write down three main things that you know the character says, or I want you to determine what your response would be, right? Um, so those are, uh, kind of some of the strategies I would recommend. Yeah. So we had a question about um, vocabulary strategies and what would be your preferred strategy or one of two preferred strategy to teach vocabulary? Ah, uh, so that, that kind of deserves its own webinar in and of itself. Um, my perspective on vocabulary teaching has evolved over the years. Um, I used to think that I needed to present everything in advance, that all the keywords they needed to know before they could read the text. I no longer feel that way. Um, my preferred strategies now are that I want to give them activities where they learn the vocabulary by doing the activity and they can refer to the activities if they'd like, you know, uh, like to a vocabulary list or something um, in some of them, but a scavenger hunt is a really good example of that. So uh, for example, if you, if you think about the beginning of the year when they don't know any Spanish and they're learning classroom objects, I could give them a list of classroom objects and we could pronounce them all and then I could give them some text with classroom objects, but it's much more effective for me to say, okay, Here's a list of objects in Spanish. Your job is in the next 10 minutes, I want you to find out what the names of as many of these are as possible. And you're going to do that by standing up and looking around the room and looking at all the things that are labeled. You can do that with other things as well. So even if it's not classroom objects, maybe um, I'm using art or I'm using, you know, all you have to have are pictures basically. So you can put pictures up that are labeled and then they have to go find um, what the vocabulary is. Or maybe I'm going to give them a task and in order to do the task, they've got to figure out what some of the words mean. So it might mean that they have to look some things up or it might mean that in the course of doing like a simulation, maybe I'm going to be a plant and I'm going to say, you know, I'm gonna hold up a picture or, or hold up a plant and say, oh, mira, tiene hojas, tiene all the things that the plant has. And then we're going to act it out as they're, um, you know, participating in a simulation of some sort. So honestly, a lot of the strategies that you would see in an elementary classroom, I find actually work really well for high school and college as well. Yeah. 
Thank you. There was another question related to translanguaging and whether you would allow it in your in your class. And if yes, or yes or no, why? <laughs> That's a very controversial hot topic. I have actually had some really interesting conversations with a colleague of mine whose primary background and, and specialization is in teaching um, English to speakers of other languages, TESOL. And um, the conclusion that we have sort of jointly come to together is from my perspective as a Spanish or a, as a foreign language teacher, and as somebody who also works with dual language immersion students, I think it's important for our students to use all of their linguistic resources. That said, um, my own personal perspective is that I think it's also really important for students to be in the target language as much as possible. So I try to set up my environments and my activities in such a way that they're not having to resort to the native language um, unless there is a really clear specific reason for doing so. Um, so sometimes a teacher might purposefully choose to use both languages in order to accomplish some sort of pedagogical purpose. But what I tend to tell my student teachers is that I try to encourage my student, uh, I try to encourage them to stay in the target language because when they do, their students are more likely to follow, number one. Number two, um, because in my particular teaching context, the teacher and the classroom interaction is their only interaction in the target language often. Um, and so I want them to maximize the in-class time for that piece. But that said, like in, in especially in the, I guess I just, I wouldn't want a teacher to jump into English or whatever your first language is simply because you feel like it's too hard to do the things in the target language, I guess is what I'm saying. But if I'm doing an activity, um, I, I have not been opposed to having students respond to me in English and then I give them the Spanish back, for example. So towards the end of the, your presentation, one of the texts that you um, presented or had on one of your slides was an infographic. And that prompted a question from someone in the audience, Annalisa, who says, do infographics pa uh, pose accessibility issues? I love them, but we're being discouraged from using images in our lessons. Mm. That's actually a really great question. And I guess I should also say, I don't claim to be an expert on anything. <laughs> this is what you're getting today is the result of my own research, my own reading, my own personal experience and study. And there are multiple perspectives about these things, both with regard to the translanguaging and regard to, to this. That said, um, I think there are a lot of things that you can do. So for example, um, when you're putting PowerPoint presentations together, there are places where you can um, right click and put in alternate text descriptions for the images. It's a lot of extra work for the teacher, or I shouldn't say extra work, but it, it definitely adds to the workload. Um, I came out of a context where I had lots of different exceptionalities in my classes. So my, I had students who were blind I taught in a school where I had hearing impaired interpreters with me almost all day long um, because we were the designated hearing impaired school for the school district. Um, and those students took Spanish. Uh, I had students who were ADHD, learning disabled, et cetera. And so um, I guess my short answer is I still used images with all of those students. However, if you're going to use images, you have to be very thoughtful about the student who is visually impaired, who can't see them. So what am I going to do for that student? Well, for that student, I might need to do more manipulatives. I might need to make sure that when I'm drawing things on the board or using images that I'm describing them as we are interacting with them so that that student can have access to that information orally. Um, I might have that student paired with other students. So basically, I guess the short answer is multimodality. 
Mm -hmm. the, the more that you are um, providing the input through multiple senses, the more likely it is that all students will be able to be successful, even though every student might miss a little piece here or there, depending on what their individual needs or issues are or interests. There was one question left in the Q and A, and you actually we had you had some um, difficulty understanding what uh, the participant was asking, and actually uh, she uh, in the chat she kind of rephrased this. It's how can we can we lead students uh, to think more deeply with questions in, when answering questions? Oh, that's a great one. Um, I'll answer that on two levels. So. At the K-12 level, there are lots and lots of really great resources available um, through language arts programs that talk about questioning techniques. So I would encourage you to look into those if you're at that level. At the college level, one of the things that I have done with my students is I've started realizing that their answers get progressively better. And this is actually true in K-12 as well. If you ask them to support what they're saying. So in class, um, if they uh, ask a question and, or if I ask a question and they give me a, a short, simple answer, then I might say, because, and encourage them to elaborate on that answer. We do writing activities that would um, also have them do that. So I might say, Juan sings, and then they would take turns expanding that sentence. And then when we get to the end, I would, you know, they have their, their sentence, they count up their words, however many they have, and then I would say, okay, now see if you can ask each other questions about this. When does Juan sing? Oh, he sings in the morning. Okay, add that to your sentence. Where does Juan sing? Oh, he sings in the morning um, in the car. Okay, add that to your sentence. And so I'm not answering this very clearly, but I guess um, what I'm trying to explain is that the more that you ask students to elaborate by giving them little prompts or pushes or little mini tasks or asking them to support what they're saying with evidence from the text. So if my graduate students make a comment, then I say, according to what theory or what thing that you've read. Um, and it just takes a lot of practice is the short answer. Uh, one interesting comment that I also saw, uh, saw through is that uh, one of the participants is actually a math teacher and said that uh, he or she could actually use many of the strategies that were discussed in the webinar today in his math class. That's absolutely true. Um, I used to supervise teachers from all different disciplines and these, these strategies do work very well because reading is a key part of no matter what discipline you're, you're doing. Um, right. Yeah, that's great. Great. Well, uh, I think we're going to um, to end this webinar and uh, I encourage everyone here that if you have further questions for Sherry's, please reach out to her. Thank you so much to our presenter and thank you so much to uh, those of you in the audience. And I hope that we will, you will be joining us for our next webinar uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you to Circle thank for you. hosting this. Thank you.